Okay, let's talk about uh, Ukraine and Russia. And uh, from what I understand, from what I'm reading from, uh, from much of the Western press, is uh, Russian troop movements in, uh, in and around Ukraine. And uh, we've, been, we've done a couple of videos, and we've been talking for the past month, maybe even more, about how things are heating up in, uh, in Ukraine, in the east of Ukraine. And there may be a possible uh, reignition of the, uh, of the conflict there. I mean, there, there is fighting that takes place on a daily basis, but uh, we haven't seen it break out into an all-out an all war like what we saw after the Obama coup in, uh, in 2014. But uh, we are seeing a lot of movement, and most recently we have seen Russian troop movement. Of course, Blinken is, uh, is saying that he's alarmed by this. NATO is saying that this is once again Russian aggression, and uh, you know this is unacceptable, and all these things from Blinken and NATO. But there may be other reasons as to why the Russians are uh, moving troops around. And uh, you have some thoughts on that, Alexander, mm. what's going on here? Well, uh, well, well, absolutely. But I mean, the first point I want to make is that um, we've been talking, as you know, about, and as, as many of our viewers know, um, about this topic several times in programmes over the last few weeks. And I've also discussed it on my channel. There have been, over the last several weeks, large deployments of Ukrainian forces to the ceasefire line. This has been done in violation of a ceasefire agreement that was entered into by Ukraine and the Donbass republics in July last year, brokered by Russia, Germany and France. Now, that movement of Ukrainian troops provoked no concerns, no expression of concerns in Western capitals. You didn't hear Blinken talking about that. You didn't even read about it in the Western media, that was as if it hadn't happened. Now, a, uh, Russian troops are being redeployed to the Ukrainian border in obvious response to that Ukrainian move. And suddenly we hear all kinds of expressions of concern about it. Anyway, the Russians have responded and uh, pa uh, Dmitry Peskov who is Putin's spokesman, said the following. The Russian Federation transfers the armed forces on its soil, on its soil, as it wants to. This should not concern anyone and is not posing a, any threat to anyone. Moscow is taking all the necessary measures to ensure security of its frontiers. Um, and then he went on to say the usual thing, the Russian troops have never taken part and are not participating in the armed conflict in U on Ukraine's soil. But um, there's no doubt at all that this is a Russian counter to Ukraine's moves. If Ukraine doesn't launch an offensive in eastern Ukraine, then I don't think those troops will do anything. I think they will eventually, those Russian troops, will go back to their barracks. I expect, by the way, that that is what is going to happen. I did a long video on my channel uh, um, um, a day or so ago about this conversation that Putin had with Merkel and Macron, um, um, this virtual conference in which he seems to have spoken clearly about Ukraine and about the dangers of the situation in Ukraine. And now we see that Putin's words are being followed up with action with a major redeployment of troops onto Ukraine's border. If Ukraine pulls back, I expect those troops will pull back also. And by the way, on balance, I think that is what is going to happen. But I do find it fascinating how movements of Ukrainian troops are invisible in the West. Movements of Russian troops, which happen, as Peskov says, on Russian territory, are a cause for concern. Right. If if Ukraine, yeah, I agree. Ukraine is not going to. It will stun me if Ukraine does something. Um, if because obviously Europe, Merkel and Macron are gonna, they would have to be suicidal to, to give Ukraine the green light to go ahead, to do something. But, but we all know, that uh, Joe Biden, 
who was the de facto president of Ukraine once upon a time after the Obama coup. He did rule over Ukraine. Um, and, and I'm not, I mean, he literally did rule over Ukraine. Um, he may pull something or, he, or, his, or his people may pull something. Once again, I think it would be suicidal if they did, but you just don't know. If they did pull something, what would that mean for, uh, for Ukraine and for Europe? And you also have a lot of activity in a lot of claims in Crimea as well. You have a lot of, uh, for example, Turkey is, is definitely getting involved, especially in Ukraine and Crimea. I find that as odd as, odd as well. Uh, it, it seems that yes. there's a lot of people poking the bear. It seems that there's a lot of people, you know, with their, their fingers in the, uh, in the Ukraine pie at this very moment. And uh, I just worry that if, if something trips up, then uh, you could be heading towards a big catastrophe for, uh, for Ukraine and for Europe. Absolutely. I mean, if there is a war in Ukraine, then Ukraine will be defeated. That I am, you know, as certain as one can ever be of anything. I mean, I, I, I mean, if Russia intervenes, there is no possibility of Ukraine not being defeated. I mean, the Russian army is a far more powerful force than it was in 2014, 2015 when it uh, um you know when the previous ukraine war uh, took place and of course russia has learned to cope with sanctions and is now sanctioned hardened it's also got china at its back in a way that it didn't wasn't the case in 2014-15 so there is a war in eastern ukraine ukraine will be comprehensively defeated it will be smashed the Ukrainian military will be smashed. Um, it's quite likely that will trigger an even deeper political crisis in Ukraine itself. It would probably cause the Ukrainian economy to collapse. What is left of the Ukrainian economy to collapse? It would also, of course, create a major crisis in Europe with the neocons demanding action from Germany and France at a time when the Germans and the French are doing everything they possibly can to stop, not to take it. They're negotiating with the Russians to get Sputnik V. The Germans want to see Nord Stream 2 done. They're worried in Macron's case that Russia is becoming altogether too close to China. There are multiple concerns. And I think that the Germans and the French are almost certainly doing everything they can at the moment, especially after Merkel and Macron heard from Putin, to dial this thing down. And indeed, Peskov, in that same press conference, where he made those comments I just quoted, he said this much. He said, we, the European countries, would not like the civil war in Ukraine as a result of provocations and provocative steps by Ukraine's military to flare up again. Notice his careful reference to we, the European countries. In other words, Germany, France and Russia, that they are all opposed to a restart of the war in eastern Ukraine. And I'm sure that's what they thought the Russians are working for. And I'm sure that is what will be achieved. But if there is a demented decision in Kiev, backed by an equally demented decision in Washington to launch a war, there would be a disaster in Ukraine. And I can't help but think, in the end, that that would be very bad for the United States. I mean, it would, it would, uh, it, I can't see how it benefits the United States to see a country that is an ally of the United States and in which the United States has invested so much to be comp comprehensively defeated in that fashion. And as you rightly say, there's all sorts of poking going on in Crimea. The uh, Ukrainians have even been talking about recapturing the Crimea, which would be, I mean, a, a, a mad enterprise. I mean, the idea of the Ukrainian army trying to regain, retake Crimea from Russia would be truly suicidal. And for Erdogan to get mixed up in all of that would be incredibly foolish for him. As you say, he pokes the bear on Crimea. 
uh, Turkey has, by the way, some long-standing claims to Crimea that go all the way back to the 18th century, to the wars that uh, Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin fought when they reconquered Crimea from uh, the Ottoman Empire um, in, the, in the 18th century. I would say, I use the word reconquered carefully because, of course, from a Russian perspective, Crimea was previously part of the Eastern Slav world, and it was where uh, the uh, founding prince of Russia, Prince Vladimir, was converted to orthodoxy. It actually happened in Crimea itself. So for the Russians, this is a hugely sensitive issue. And I think if Erdogan starts getting involved in Crimea, he's, well, I think he's, he'll have taken leave of his senses also. Because to be absolutely clear about this, just as Russia is the dominant military in the Caucasus, as we discussed during the, um, the Nagorno-Karabakh war, it is far more so in the Black Sea. And in this region, I mean, anything the Turks do, anything the Ukrainians do, anything the United States does, it, 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 it would be comprehensively outmatched because the Russian military, it simply outmatches in scale any possible combination of adversaries on this territory so close and so sensitive to Russia. That isn't just my view, by the way. No less a person than Barack Obama made that very same point in an interview he gave to The Atlantic in the last year of his presidency. He, he said in that interview that in this region, the Russians always have escalatory dominance. And he's right. Yeah, one of the few times Barack Obama was correct, but it won't be the first time that the uh, that NATO and the United States, specifically the United States, doesn't start a war in order to distract from uh, a president's embarrassment. So, you know, I could definitely see a war being triggered, not because and, and even if Ukraine is, is, you know, comprehensively defeated and smashed, like you say, that won't bother the neocons or the neoliberals or the Pelosi's or Schumer's because it would serve as a good distraction away from uh, from a sleepy Joe Harris embarrassment in much the same way that uh, you had a Bill Clinton embarrassment. And, you know, many people believe and I think it was part, not all of it, but part of the reason that Clinton launched the, the offensive against uh, Serbia and it did serve and it worked. It did serve as a valuable distraction away from Bill, from Bill Clinton's Oval Office uh, blue dress Lewinsky uh, troubles. And I, I don't say it was all Absolutely. of it, but it was a part no. of the reason. I really do believe it was a part of the reason he launched that wall, that war. So you may see the same thing with, uh, with the Biden White House. Uh, Absolutely, because, of course, for the Biden White House or the Biden-Harris White House, there are aspects of this which... Uh, I mean, even a military defeat for Ukraine might be bad for the United States and global position, but it's not necessarily the case that it would be bad for the neocons or bad for some people in the White House. From their point of view, yes, it does distract attention away from some of Joe Biden's problems and failings. But of course, it does various other things. Firstly, it creates dividing lines between Russia and Europe, which is something that the neocons very, very much like. And of course, it blocks any idea of any sort of reopening of the dialogue between any part of the West and Russia, which of course the neocons are vehemently opposed to. So when they see Macron and Merkel talking to Putin, they don't like that. They want that to end. And, of course, if there was a war in Ukraine, they'd be able to push for that to end. And, of course, if they can use that to stop Nord Stream 2, so much the better. If they can use that to stop the European Union buying Sputnik V, better still. So from that perspective, from the perspective of those sort of people, I can absolutely see why they wouldn't be too bothered if Ukraine went down in flames, provided their particular domestic and geopolitical objectives are advanced. For the United States, 
I think it would not be a good thing, as I said, to see its ally be defeated and defeated in such a comprehensive way. But I don't think the neocons really are that interested in the United States itself. They have other visions and obsessions connected with their idea of global power and global hegemony and globalization and all of that. Now, you spoke about Obama. You said that Obama is right about some things. Actually, about Ukraine, Obama was catastrophically wrong. And not just wrong, but I would, well, I, I would say um, hideously and unethically wrong. Because knowing that in this region, Russia has escalatory dominance, knowing how important Ukraine is to Russia, he nonetheless let a coup, a pro-US coup, happen there. Obama is the author, the ultimate author of this crisis. He bequeathed it to subsequent US administrations. We are talking about this problem because Obama created it. And he created it notwithstanding that he knew that in Ukraine, you, the US's position is structurally and inherently a weak one. Now, there is no greater condemnation of a statesman than to, for that statesman to willfully put, to knowingly put his country in the worst possible position in a crisis of this kind. So I think the fact that Obama came along and admitted to the Atlantic that in that region, uh, Russia has escalatory do dominance. It may show that Obama has some understanding of reality, but ultimately it totally condemns him. No, I meant that, I, I, don't, I don't mean that Obama was right about Ukraine, not at all. I, I meant that the statement, that statement that he made yeah. to the Atlantic was a correct statement, that statement alone, that yes. they can't win in Ukraine because Russia has dominance in that region, that statement, that Obama is the author of Ukraine. I, I, I've been saying that from the get-go, that Obama, in, in articles and Abs videos, that Obama absolutely, was I, the author of the Ukraine disaster. That statement, that statement uh, is correct. But yeah, absolutely, he comes along after destroying the country. And literally, he destroyed a country, one of many countries that he destroyed, Libya, Syria, etc. He comes along after the fact during his last year in office and says, oh yeah, well, you know, we couldn't do anything in Ukraine because the Russians have the advantage. You know, it just shows what a, what an idiot he is. But that statement, isolated in and of itself, is, well, you know, it's I, I say to myself and I say, you didn't, you didn't know that, Barack, you didn't know that going into the coup? Now, you, now you've realized that Russia has the advantage in the region all of a sudden? You should have realized that before you committed the, uh, exactly. you, your resources to the coup d'etat in Ukraine. And it was a coup d'etat between the United States, Obama, as well as the EU. People always, you know, they try to pit it all on Obama, but Obama worked with the European Union on this coup d'etat. Absolutely. And Europe is just as responsible Absolutely. as the United States. Absolutely, of course it is. And of course the key person there, and I, you know, I'm sorry to sort of come back to her, is Angela Merkel. I mean, Angela Merkel is the leader of Germany. Germany, let's face it, experienced disaster twice in the 20th century in this particular region. So what does Merkel do? She leads it to potential disaster in that same region all over again. It does seem very bizarre and strange to me. I would have thought that any wise German leader would want to steer clear of Ukraine and would not want to disrupt the relationship with Russia. What was it, after all, that Bismarck said? The secret of politics is a good treaty with Russia. That's the correct policy for Germany always to follow. It was understood by uh, Merkel's predecessors, Willy Brandt, Helmut Kohl, uh, um, 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 Helmut Schmidt, Gerhard Schroeder, 
but Merkel forgot it and she led the EU into this blind alley and cul-de-sac because she wanted to appease the neocons. It's another example of the disastrous nature of Merkel's foreign policy and, of course, not just Merkel, but the whole EU. Yeah, and there was also the fo the, the Polish uh, foreign minister, I always forget his name, who was also one of the key architects. Sikorski, the, Rad... So, yes. Radek, yeah. Radek... Rad yeah. Radek, Radek Sikorski, who, again, has this extraordinary... I mean, not just Sikorski, but lots of other people in Poland have this utterly uh, uh, surreal conception of foreign policy. Again, what they need to do is to sort out a good treaty with Russia also. That's Poland's guarantee at the end of the day. But, of course, they have all these visceral feelings about Russia that get in the way of that. But, no, lots of authors of this, lots of, lots of countries were the authors, not just Sikorsky, there was Carl Bildt of Sweden, all of Carl these Bildt people. Carl of Sweden, yeah. Absolutely. If you, if, you, if you think all the time in that kind of way, if you allow your uh, uh, visceral dislike of a country, of Russia, to govern your decisions, then you're going to lead your country to disaster because you're taking the Russians on in a place where they have an overwhelming advantage. And that should be obvious. Yeah, I mean, the, the concern to all of this is underpinned by the fact that, uh, like I said in the beginning of the video, is, is Joe Biden, this was Joe Biden's country. It was, this was the Biden family's uh, playground for, for the better absolutely. part of what, absolutely. three years, four years? This was their playground, Ukraine. Absolutely. This is where they made absolutely. their billions. So my absolutely. fear is always, they're just gonna, they're gonna revisit it. Well, absolutely, That's, that, that, that always has to be the concern. I, I do wonder whether Joe himself now has the um, energy and the focus to really be fo to be really concentrating on that. But certainly there is a visceral issue there also, and a disastrous one, and an economic one too. Though, of course, Hunter Biden, I understand, has now just published a book in which he uh, uh, um, denies all of this. I haven't read it, so probably, probably won't bother. But anyway, he's, that's what he says. Yeah. He's been rehabilitated as an author and artist. So, yeah, maybe maybe he's not interested in uh, in Ukraine anymore. But Victoria Newland and these well, people are cake yeah. in Newland. They definitely are. And they're oh, in the White House as well. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. All right. We'll leave it there, guys. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like. Smash that like. Takes one second and, and change to hit that like. And it's free. Make sure you're still subscribed and go to... The Durant Shop. Pick up some merch. Absolutely. Our wonderful magic mugs, the best in the world. Our brilliant Durant t-shirts, long-sleeved and short-sleeved. Our hoodies, like the great one that Alex is wearing. Our sweatshirts, our hats, all with the flags of various countries. Uh, our t-shirts, 100% cotton. Our mugs, the best in the world. And please also check us out on our other channels, my channel, Alex's channel, the new channel we have, where we show you our interactions, our live interactions with our viewers on our live streams, and also look us up on our other platforms, BitChute, Library, Rumble, and Odyssey. Check out our Discord server too, and if you can, support us through PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar. And we look forward to you joining us in our next programme, and please check your subscription to this channel. All right, and I'll put a discount code for the Durant shop down below. So look for that discount, discount code in, uh, in the description box or maybe as a, as a pinned comment. All right, take care, everybody.